Dave here. How are you? Today is the 31st of October 2021. I hope everyone's had a good week. Uh, you can see that I had a bit of a mishap with uh, my home grooming gear. You know what it's like? You get a bit done, you get a bit done. I'll just nip that off. Oh, fuck. I've got to tidy the other side up to balance it. I'll give this a bit of a trim. Oh, too far. <laughs> That's what you end up with. Anyway, not to worry. I hope the, uh, the sound is coming through fine. Um, AV all good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, today on the show, I'm going to start building the plane till that I said that, you know, we were going to start a week or so ago. And on the intro, you might have seen I'd laid out the, uh, the planes in order as to how I want them. These are them over here. I kind of, when, when I'm doing a project, let me step back from that a little bit. When I start a project, I like to have it so that it, I lay it out on a bench and if it's a visual thing like this and I'll set the planes up in different manners and then I'll walk away, come back maybe the next day and have a look at it and go, no, I'm not happy with that. I'll move that around. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle until your mind says, yes, that's right. Now, the plane till is not going to just have planes in it. It's all going to have my little hammer that I use to adjust the block planes. I'm going to have camellia oil in it. I'm going to have a candlestick in there as well. And also my, um, it looks good. <laughs> Thanks, Wally. You're talking from experience, buddy. Um, so it's, uh, someone's just making a comment about my hair. Uh, so it's also going to have the right angle uh, guide, two of them for the steel one, for the jointers, and also the timber one that I made for my hand plane. Now you might see that this surface looks very, very shiny. And the reason being, I have got one of these boards. This is from the local hardware store. You know, everyone has this one big box store in Australia. And it's pre-laminated uh, spotted gum. Now I've sanded it down to 120 and then put clear contact on it because we're going to put it over on the um, CNC and we're going to trench out dados. Now, what I did was I measured all the width of the, the soles of the planes and came up with something that was close, but I've gone a little bit wider than the soles and I'm creating a 10 millimeter wide dado in between each one. So for you in the States and people who don't, aren't metrified, is that a word? Uh, it will be just uh, um, around 3 eighths of an inch, just over 3 eighths of an inch wide and 3 millimeters deep, so it's just under 1 eighth of an inch deep. We're going to create some 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeter deep or yeah, thick pine dividers and we're going to put a half round on the top and so it's easy enough just to pop those in. The reason I've done the contact is so that when I come to gluing them in, I probably won't glue them during the show today, glue it up next week or during the week. I don't get, I don't have to worry about, you know, cleaning along. There's going to be a lot of dividers here. So I thought it might be easier to put the laminate, sorry, the, the clear contact on prior to putting on the machine. Now, one of the other things on the machine, I've put a spiral down cutter, which means it's going to be forcing this laminate down. It's not going to try and pick it up and peel it off. I've had that problem before and it's very embarrassing. <laughs> Um, one of the other things that I need to tell you is how I worked out for how this plane is, this, this till is going to work. I got some of the planes and I actually held the plane up. Let's go with Arthur's trying plane here. And I got a digital protractor. This is, gives me a reading here. And I held it up against it until I realized I had to have stop it falling that direction. If it was still wanting to tip backwards, not steep enough. So it's just the little things. I was going to have it seven degrees. Now I think it's closer to, let me see, I'll turn it on, see what it tells me. It's um, 15 degrees that it's going to lean back. So in the next show, we're going to get Cole's Gifkin's jig out and I'm going to create a raking frame for it that this will go inside of. So it's, it's going to be similar to the battery charger and the, the lens and camera thing that I made, but this is going to be slightly different where it's actually a panel that's going to sit back into it 
and the bottom of the frame is going to be the support for the heels of all of the planes. So it's a fun project. It's going to French cleat on the wall. If you want to do something like this, jump in and do it. It's not an expensive project to do. Instead of using the CNC, you can set up a straight edge and get a trim router and just zap these dados out, possibly in one pass with a little 3 8 cutter, only going an eighth of an inch deep. That's 9.36 or whatever it is in Australia by 3 mil. Okay, let's move it over there. I'm going to have a quick read down here first. Metrified rhymes with petrified. That's a good one, Carl. Phil, how are you? Uh, Ron, morning, Dave. Thanks for help with the remote switch. My dust collector works great. Please to help. Please to help. Uh, Eric, morning. Uh, Jason, Metrified, what happens with Halloween, Halloween candy? Nathan, hi, Carl. Saying hi to everyone, Nathan. Hello, Carl. Mark, morning. Morning, Tom, Southern California. Now, a lot of people, hey, baby. A lot of people will be going uh, backwards, you know, spring forwards. We had spring forwards around about two or three weeks ago. It was the first or the second weekend of October. That's when daylight saving started for us. You guys, I think the UK this, and parts of Europe will be falling backwards. So they'll be going back an hour. So it's going to create a two hour difference from what it was only a few weeks ago. So, you know, for for the guys in Europe, instead of one o'clock in the morning, it might be three o'clock in the morning that the show goes live. And only the diehards will be watching, and I'm sure that Mark Bongus is going to be one of those guys. All right, let me see what we've got here. That's starting to catch on there. I'll switch the uh, cap. First of all, I've got to cut the end off this. That might end up being an issue for me if I don't. Uh, where are we? Just going to whip the end of this contact off. Do you know you can sharpen the blades in these things? I've seen so many people, and I used to be one of them, that threw the blades away. Just a quick hone on an oil stone and away you go. The first time I saw that was a carpet layer because they're using these all the time and he just had an oil stone beside him going for it. I'm sure I'm willing to bet that most of us in our 46, just because most of us are using our real names. That's, yes, uh, indeed, <laughs> true. Uh, it's the other way around, was 3 a.m. will be 1 a.m. next week. Oh, well, there you go. It's going to be earlier for you guys. So maybe more people will be watching. Unlucky for them. All right, switch cameras, and we'll get out there. There we go. All right. Pop this down on the floor to start. And we'll move the machine back a little bit. First thing I'm going to do is what's called home it. Not home, uh, home the machine. So it's going to come up back over here and up to the front here. And that's basically saying, all right, I know where my soft limits are so that at no time it's going to go bang into the edge of the, the machine and cause it grief. There's something, once you load the machine up, it's something you really must do. So we say home. So now the Z axis is coming all the way up till it gets near the sensor and it'll stop. Then it'll come over to the Y. Here it comes. Over to the X, I should say. Now it's going to go down to the Y. So it's going to the Y sensor and also the slave sensor on the other side. It's squaring itself all up and it says, yeah, I'm there. Done. Now I'm going to tell it to go to zero. It's not going to change the height at all. It's just going to go to zero, to the work zero. And that's it. Lower it down. Great. Now I'm going to send it back out of the way so I can put the board on. Shift button and this, and it makes it go fast. OK, he's out of the way. There is no top or bottom on this one as far as the height's concerned. I'm hoping it'll fit across. We'll see what happens. This is 1200 wide, so it's just under four feet for you guys in the States. And I'll pull that one up and put that one there. Bring it back. Come around the other side. Now, on in Aspire, what I've done with these dados is I've told it to 
go past by around about 10 millimetres. Otherwise, I'd end up with a semicircle in the dado here, and I don't want that. Basically, the diameter of the cutter, or the radius of the cutter, would be left there. I give it a bit of a thump like that just to make sure everything's pulling down. The other thing is, when it, because it's a spiral cutter, it's going to be forcing things down. It's not, if it was a spiral up and it was starting to dig deep holes, it might want to start to try and lift the board. So because it's full on dados, it's going to be fine. That's not going anywhere. Now it's going to make a little bit of noise. I'm going to bring it back and uh, touch off the zero. Shift and back to here. And page down. I'm just going to do this manually, which means I'm going to get down here and have a look. That is looking pretty good. It's just, just touching the laminate or the uh, contact. So I'm going to say zero Z. So I've just told the machine. Okay. Now, one of the other things that I need to do is I'm just going to raise it up and go to zero again. Going to line it up this way. I'm pretty sure that's work zero. Page down. I could use the touch plate and touch it off. But I, this isn't an extremely accurate. I'm going to be cutting the. I'm going to be cutting the board after I've run the machine over it. This is basically just to create the dados. Now, I'm not going to put the dust hood on, but I will turn the dust extractor on. So it's going to pull some of the stuff up. But people get bored watching this, if they if this is sitting on top. So I will throw myself on my sword and I will clean everything up after. <laughs> All right, these things, very essential. I'm in the room here, you're not, so I'm the one at risk. Just going to check everything's good here. I've got to turn the frequency drive on, variable frequency drive. That actually makes the spindle spin. Um, reading through everything, my instructions up here. Okay, and I've got the program in. I'm going to go to cycle start. We'll make a bit of a noise, and I'm going to park the cursor over the stop button just in case. That's good. Turn this on. I've forgotten to turn the dusky on, but there she goes now. Come back in here and do a little bit of reading while that's happening. It's powering along, along very well. It's a fair bit easier than a straight edge and a uh, <laughs> and a hand router, but I'm very fortunate to have it.
be interesting to see how it goes with this other clamp. It's missing the plastic ones perfectly. But I'll miss this. I think it'll do quite well. We'll probably just go to the side of it. There's no steel in that part of it. See that? And the next one, it'll miss it as well. It'll just, just cut into it a little bit. No, oh, missed totally. Couldn't have, couldn't have sorted it out better. Second last pass. That's all right. Oh yeah, I understand why. All good. Okay. Turn the dusty off. Should be ready for it to page up and get it out of the way now. Done. Cool. That's nice. Come on. It's my this board. Lovely. Switch the cameras back. There we go. Nice and quick and clean, hey? I'm going to check I've got the right amount of data in there. I thought it was going to do one more, but that's okay. It's going to be fine. So I've got these three. I can quickly check here. Uh, it's over on the other screen. So I can quickly check here. 78 and 85. This last one doesn't need to have a data on it because the edge of the frame that we're going to make is going to come proud. This is going to recess into the frame that we're going to make with Cole's jig next week. So roughly, we've got plenty of time. Roughly, this is how they're going to go. That one is going to go there. Then the jack plane is going to go beside it. And that fits in nicely. Then my two little planes here, these are all the same width in the body. That one's possibly just a little bit narrower. That one and that one, the Stanley number six is going to go there. My little handmade block plane will go there. Then we're going to have things up above. That will possibly go in there. I made it just wide enough for the hammer to go in. If the hammer doesn't fit there, it'll go there. So that one is the same width. The Camellia oil is going to go in here somewhere. There'll be a candle there as well. So we'll do all the divisions this way. That's what we're about to start next. And then I'm going to create little dividers that go across. I won't be making dados for those. I'll just be making them to sit on the surface. I may put a little dado in the sides of these partitions going this way. But this is going to look really, really nice. This one here, that skinny, skinny fellow is for my fence, for this fence. It's going to go there. And here's something, this one here. All right, let's, let's put these in because I'll just go silly. So 
my trying plane that I made is going to go there. My new plane, that which we're going to be using a little bit later on today, the number four and three quarters, goes there. And then this last spot is for the new one I'm making. It's going to go in here. Now, it looks like it's nowhere near wide enough because it hasn't got the sides on it yet. This is a little block plane that I'm making. So I'm going to, this is like a set for jointing, for smoothing, and for edges and what have you. And it's going to be slightly steeper. This is a 50 degree bed, so it's 40 degrees from here. That, that angle there is 40 degrees. So there we go. All right. Um, more good luck in management with the clamp there, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> I reckon so. Um, Phil, Dave, do you think CNC could replace other tools like jointers or planers? Um, not really, Phil. It's, it's one of those things, it's, it's another tool. If that's all it is, it replaces some things, um, but, but not everything. No. So I want to create some holes here for chisels to drop into. Now, I think I'll probably end up using the domino for that because I can set it up at an angle and it's going to have a nice wide mortise. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, on the CNC, my machine doesn't have a fifth axis, axis which means, so you've got, you got the X, Y, and Z are your th main three axes as a normal machine. Then the fourth axis is normally what's called a rotary axis where it's like a lathe. It will turn an object underneath and the CNC will go up and down, basically backwards and forwards. This, it, I don't think it'll use, even use the Y axis. It'll probably just be the X and the Z, depending on which way you've got your rotary uh, axis mounted, whether it's going across or along the machine. And then there's another one, which is a fifth axis, which the CNC itself actually tilts. The head, the spindle tilts, so it can go burrowing in. They're amazing, absolutely fantastic. Anyway, so that's going to be really nice. So the next thing we're going to do is, I'll move these out of the way. How are we doing for time? 25 past. I'll move these out of the way and you'll see this in the meantime. Hello children. <laughs> this is what I glued up on the last show. And if you saw the video on me working on the deck up in the house, it, uh, it wasn't any good because Let's say this is the tree fern. It was like that. And I didn't like it. Like this is exaggerated big time. I wanted it like that in the center. So I created another one of these out of um, 140 millimeter wide decking. And I put a hole that was eccentric, it was off to one side so that these married up when it dropped in between the boards on the deck. So all of the boards were still full boards across I didn't have half a board that I was kind of cutting into. And then all of the boards coming up this way were cut 45, 90 and 45. And it looks pretty cool. But now what I've done is I've put a rebate around the back, or you guys in the States call a rabbit, for a mirror. So I'm going to get Picky to make a cut of mirror for me. And I'll set that in there and that'll be a nice little mirror frame. Nothing's wasted. Nothing wasted. I'm quickly going to pop these out of the way. Oh, here's another tip. If you go, if you're going to lay things out like this and work out what you're after, take a photo. Take a photo of the end result because then you just go back to that photo and refer to it. Because I'd do it and I'd, you know, knowing me, I'd try and be jamming the plane in the wrong spot. It worked last time. Why isn't it working now? <laughs> All right. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to do some thin rips. I'll have a quick read first. Hi, Groovejet. Michael dropped the Stanley block plane and broke the support. Oh, that's no good. Um, how to make an adjustable wedge to hold it in? Or now, how do? Well, if that Stanley block plane has got the, the little bar across it, you might be able to get something in there. I don't know. I'd have to have a look at that. Um, uh, Vicky's arranging a dinner. Um, 
you, Dave, you need V2, Michael Christopher. Okay, I possibly do. Uh, or V11, PMV11, I don't know. Uh, thinking, and then the next thing. All right. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to switch the cameras. We'll go down to the table. I've already got a camera set up there. So I've got four cameras running at the moment. Crazy. Uh, I'm going to um, switch the cameras over to the table saw. We're going to rip how many of these? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen of them. That'll be a lucky number, I'm hoping. So I'll show you how I've got a little homemade thin rip jig. It's easy, easy, easy. You don't need to go and buy one. Just do it. Here we go. Swing you around. Stainless steel so you don't crack it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> All right. So this is my thin rip jig. It's a couple of clamps and a board. That's all it is. Now, what I want to do is I want to get 10 millimeters here. So I need a ruler. And I'm going to check the width of these dados. I'm pretty sure it's all 10. They are. I'm going to make the thin rips that I do 11 millimeters because I'm not going to go backwards and forwards to the jointer. I'm going to just rip, 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 rip. Pardon me. And then we're going to use the plane to sort things out. So I'll grab my muffs for eye protection, all that kind of stuff. I think it was very generous of me to leave the dust control off the CNC then. Um, don't put that on quite yet. So how we do this? Pencil. And I think I've got a heap of sharp pencils here. Yes, I do. I'm going to mark 11 millimeters here to start, right up near the end. That's the width that I want. So, uh, wrong side. David, I need to have it on, on this side. No, I need it on here, this piece of wood, not on the jig. Forget. I'm still thinking about Michael's comment. All right, I want 11. So I'm going to take it off the, this side, obviously. So there we are, 10, 11. I don't know if you can see that. I've got a tiny mark just there. Now the thing is, rip blades, or just about all saw blades, have got what's called a kerf. That's the thickness of the actual cut. The kerf is normally wider than the thickness of the body of the blade. So the teeth will be sitting proud. Normally the teeth will favor one side and then the next tooth will favor the next. Next one, that one, back, alternating. So I'm gonna set this up so that this is working to the left side. So it'll be the pointy one to the left, if I can put it that way. Very simply, I'll put it there and release this and bring it up so that it's just that's it that's spot on I've got this I've got the fence set there now I'm gonna put a weight on there so it doesn't go tumble tumble needs a bit more of a weight there there it's doing it then I'm gonna put this up against it, but I'm not going to go past the beginning of the blade. I'm just going right at the beginning of the blade and I'm pushing this way so that wherever I clamp this down to the table, it's not going to foul the piece of wood the next time I bring it through. So first clamp I'm going to put on, I'm using deep throat clamps so I can get reach underneath. My cast iron table has got ribs all the way under the wing. So I need to be able to find a spot for this to go back up inside. You need something that's going to have a little bit of travel to get past the lip of the edge of the table. So I'm just going to duck under here and 
see where I can get it. That's a pretty good spot right there. Once I've got that clamped like that, that's pretty good. Now I can move this and pivot it ever so slightly that direction. And it's pushing. So what's that that's doing is because my pivot point is here, it's going to swing around a little bit, so it's going to act as a lead in, and the point that's crucial is right there. So I can now leave that just, you can see I've got a pinch there. And hopefully it doesn't go and make me look sillier than I am with my new haircut. <laughs> so I'm finding a spot down here that I can get the clamp onto. And I'm gonna give it the business, tighten it right up. Good. Now that should allow me to slide the timber in. That's nice, that's, that's pretty good. Now what happens now is my first cut will be my thin rip. Then I'll release this put the board back against my thin rip jig, lock the fence, go again. And it's just, that's gonna be multiples. All right, everything's working there. Put these on. I'm gonna do a quick check on the chat. Um, Mark and Dave, why wouldn't you swap the fence to the other side? No. Nope. Now, if I move it to the other side, there's no real advantage. So I'm trying to get it so that I'm not having a thin piece of timber between the fence and the blade. I've got the, the meat of the board between the blade, sorry, the blade and the fence. So it's my off cut. This is, this is what I'm after. I'm after the offcut. I don't have enough room here when my blade guard is down to be able, if I had that fence up here, it'll be right up against the, the edge there and I'd end up in trouble. Like that, that's fine. So now I'm gonna turn it on. It's gonna make a little bit of noise. Oh, one thing as well, I've also already set the height of the blade so that the bottom of the gullet is in line with the top of this board. This is just straight out clear pine. Now, one thing I should have done Just run the board through first, just to make sure that it's dead parallel. Which it isn't, so we'll just force it through. I'm going to back it off just a touch. It's squeezing it too much. There we go. There we go. There's my thin rip. That's the off cut. Now, I'll turn it off. What I'm going to do now is release this, pull it up until it touches there, lock it again. And now I can go through again. That's better.
got that same problem. And this time to alleviate that problem, I'll flip the board over. So now I put what was kind of like the fat end up against it. To make it a whole lot safer, what I could have done was cut a 45 degree across here or an angle back so that I'm only really pushing up against that point. I did try and counter it by pivoting. You remember when I set it up? This is fine. We'll see what happens. Much better. So I've got three there. Bring them across. Four. I'm getting down a little bit closer to the blade, so I'm going to start using the guide, the push stick, I should say. Remember, it's crucial to have this just in front of the blade, so you're not you're not pinching it like crazy. So that part at the beginning was basically because this board was like a wedge. It was slightly wider at the rear end, only a millimetre. I really should have just pushed it through on its own just to make sure it was dead parallel. Now also at the back here I have the splitter that holds the guard up and that splitter is protecting me from anything going back and touching the back of the blade that's on its upstroke. So whilst I'm reaching around at the back, some people might think that's a bit dangerous, but if you've got the guard on with a splitter, it's pretty safe. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Three to go. Two to go. One left. What I'll do is I'll bring the camera around the other side here. Should be able to see it there. I'll quickly check. Yep. I'm putting it against the, my jig for the stop. Bring the fence over to it and push it through. Done.
There we go. All right. Apply over a 300 Milwaukee radio. Uh, because plans they were using the blue line blade. No, I'm just using a standard rip blade. Um, fence is fine, Kiwi. Quickie reading. Gripper handle thin rips like this. Um, Phil, using the micro, yeah, for, for small things, it's okay, but I, I'm a little bit of a fanatic as far as guards are concerned. Now, I, and when I use those uh, push blocks from micro jig, the, the grippers that straddle over the top of the blade, and I'm holding down on something and it's plastic. I just, I do it. I've got them and I use them in, in particular areas. But this is just a little bit safer. I like to have the guard. I like to have the dust extraction. Um, those things, they straddle over the top of the blade and you push your hand straight over the top of the blade. And there's only this much between your knuckles. <laughs> that I just feel a little bit nervous and I'm a bit of a thrill seeker and that makes me nervous. Uh, Okay, it wouldn't be just as easy to set your fence to the width that you wanted. Rob, I just went through that. Um, no, because I'm getting, I don't want to have a 10 millimeter piece going through with my guards and all that kind of stuff over the top. I can't control it. This I can control. That's right. And, the, and you're jamming things in there. It's just... Not a good idea. I'm going to put the camera over in front of the router table now. We'll hook into that part. I'll have a look to see if that's going to be okay. <sighs> uh, Mike, thanks Dave. It all made sense once the dust guard was clipped in. Yes, just, I don't know, I'm, I'm not that blasé that I just hook in and, you know, oh, let's see, see what we can do here and lose a finger or two. And now I'm going to do something I probably should have done a little bit earlier, and that is to check the width of this. Now it's got to go into there. I'm a little wide. I'll probably run it through the thickness up, just run it through the thickness plane, and that'll be fine. I could have made it a little bit less. Um, so I'm going to show you how I'm going to do the roundover. But before that, let's get the hand plane out and see if, see if it works. This is the little one that I made. Um, which ones shall I use? I need some stops. Where have I got them? Down here. I'm going to use these in this particular instance because they're nice and low. I love this bench. <laughs> Have I told you? Um, people are getting Christmas orders in. If you want one, give me a shout. Just emails down the bottom. Just send me an email. Is that going to be too deep? That is a little bit on that one. That's all right. Put those out of the way. Um, maybe if I bring that one along a little, maybe up to about here. How's that look? Checking direction on the grain. All right. Let's give this little guy a try. You like that? This is a beautiful plane. There we go. You're not going to get much better than that. I'm going to roll her over, end for end, pop her in, and go again.
Carl cam for this. You watch it curling out. Um, there we go. Another pass. Isn't that beautiful? That's that's a joy. It's a joy. I'm going to try it in the slot now. Yeah, it'll need a few more. It'll need a few more, but that is such a nice result. Uh, what grit stones? I I go. I use on this particular machine. I, I on this blade. I sharpened on the Triton whetstone and then on the little uh, polishing wheel it's got and then I went to uh, using auto sole uh, metal polish on a leather strop and that's how I got that I can also go through on the Sorby Pro Edge and take it down to 3000 and I'll get just as good a result there but I always finish up with the auto sole or the or the rouge on the strop and man and man it comes up you can see how sharp it is it's a and this is a beautiful plane it's so nice and so is the big fellow and that's what it's all about we're trying to get this happening um i've got something to show you next wally wally bronson's watching and he's a sender in or this week if you've got projects send them in to me and i'll show everyone on the show now Wally has done something that kind of tricked me up. I was, I was looking at it, I was thinking, how the hell has he done this? So I'm going to show you a picture of the finished product. And that looks pretty sexy. What do you think about that? So we're going to come back to the first picture. This is how it all started. He says, hi Dave, here are some photos of a small snack table I made for my wife that she wanted for our family room. The top tray is removable for a serving tray if need be. I'll take you back to refresh your memory. So there's a tray up the top that can be removed. Not the wooden part. It's, I think it's just above. I think. Back to the beginning. So I had this idea of something different for the legs. So I'll try and explain how I did it. I milled some leftover cherry that I, I had in stock to three quarters of an inch by four inches wide by 24 inches long. So roughly guys, that's 19 mil by 102 by 610, roughly millimeters. And some maple to three eighth, 10 mil, four inch, 102 by 24, 608, 610, something like that. Uh, and glued it in between the four pieces of the cherry, two on each side of the maple, as in photo one. So what he's got there is that lighter piece of timber in the middle then what he did, he says, after cutting a 45 degree angle so that the maple is corner to corner now. So have a look on the right hand side of that picture. See the one piece there? It's got white going diagonally now. And this is where it all becomes really apparent. So now the corner is the finishy leg size of two and three eighths of an inch square. So that's around about 60 millimeters and then cutting out the leg profile in photo two. So you can see the little cuts there that he's done. He's done two cuts. Now, at first glimpse, it looks for all the world to be that he's bent that piece of maple around, but it's an optical illusion. And also the fact that he's rotated. So you're cutting through a cross section at 45 degrees. And then with the assistance of the bandsaw creating that cutting that scallop out it really has come up well it's just amazing that it's such a smart idea All right now the next next cutting tenon on both ends of the leg and top of the frame which is this one that's not too bad And then close up of the assembly, um, frame assembled together with lock mortise router bit, which is, which is what I've got there. Let's go to this picture, it shows you, whoop, no, let's go back to this one. It shows you a bit further away. 
and then the close-up shows you the lock mortise corner. So together with lock miter router bit, notice uh, lock finger joint corner on the frames. Yes, we saw that, Wally. <laughs> uh, and then after three coats, come down here, of gloss clear polyurethane and some casters, here's the finished table. You know what, Wally, I think that's a work of art. And of course, um, this would be something good for my place. The reason being, coffee and things wouldn't get spilt all over the place. You could have that beside the couch. And I think you've got a picture of it there beside the couch. That's ideal, the right height for the armrest, all that kind of stuff. Put your stuff in there so you're not going to destroy the carpet. And away you go. So I, I think that's great. Great job, Wally. Now, if you've got a project, it doesn't have to be up to Wally standard, or it can be better than Wally standard. If you've got it, send them in. You know, we have so many different levels of people watching, uh, and they are going to possibly pick up a little idea, like that idea with Wally. Glue it all up, run a 45 degree cut, flip her over, and then 45 on the other, and then you can just set it up to be 90 degrees, cut it, run through a thickness planer, and then cut your scallops out. What a sexy leg. There we go. Um, so smart. Uh, you want one, baby, do you? Well, Wally might make one and post it over <laughs> for you. Oh, dear. It's very, very clever. Very clever. I can see a few people are going to be copying that straight away. But do it, honestly. My email is in the show more description box down the bottom. Let's go over to the router table and get started over there. Bring my cup of tea with me and this one stick. I'll work on this one and show you exactly what I'm looking at doing. I'll move those guys over there. Now that's from that's from one board. It's so much cheaper than going out and buying this stuff milled. They're going to be great. Now what I'd started off doing was in here I have, I'll, I'll just wind her up, you can have a look. I've got a semicircular cutter, so it's kind of, um, I think it's a quarter inch, so 6.35 millimeters. I'll get this fellow all the way up. And my router table is disconnected, as I always show you. So here, with that, it was going to be a little wide. I was getting a shoulder, and I thought, ah, oh, nice, nice detail. But I was thinking, you know, as I'm putting planes back in the till, I didn't want any catch points. So I thought we'd just do it outright, making it with a, um, a nice semicircle that's going to work. So I'm going to use a 3 16th roundover. So 3 16th is basically four millimeters. Four and a half. Close enough. Someone's going to check it on the internet, I bet you, and get back to me and say, David, no, it's not. Someone's going to be very helpful for me, aren't they? Let's crack that. Again, with a router table, you spin it a few times, and it locks again. That's, that's just how they work. Don't panic. And undo that last little bit. Now, I have this. You might see this is a new router that I put in here. Um, I took my Triton out because I'm going to use it elsewhere. And I put this in because I like the fact that I can do all of this from above. It's a new style of router in there. It's not holding an old router. It's designed to grab around the barrel, all that stuff. The only thing I don't like about it is I don't like the quarter inch collet. It doesn't close up tight enough for me. So I've got a, an insert, a reducer, and this is one of Cole's, and it works perfectly. It's got exactly the same pattern as this half inch collet is. The half inch collet is brilliant, Oh, one of the other things about the router, it's in there. The air is drawn from the bottom. So that's where oh, oh, the dust collector is pulling like crazy. So it's kind of clean air. Uh, and then it's blown out at the top. And I was thinking, well, that's going to be a pain in the neck. But the, what happens is there's a diffuser at the top. And it's, got, it's like a, a heap of fan blades, like a, like a turbine style blade in it that makes all the air go out flat. So what it does, it's not pushing the dust back up in your face. The air is still allowed to be pulled down through the top. And it, this, the router actually throws all the dust out sideways. 
and it drops down and it goes around the outside of whatever you've got, the, the cupboard or the cabinet, uh, or a box if you've got the router in it, and it uh, goes straight to your dust collection. This, I, lo I like this router. I like it a lot. So I'm going to put this in, which is my um, 3 16th. I'm going to line up the slots there, put that in, let it drop all the way to the bottom until I finish nipping it. And then I'm going to pull this cutter up just a little bit because it's got the K-line there. I've explained what a K-line is before. There's a little line on the cutter that says that's where you need to tighten. Oh, sorry, that's, that's where it needs to be in the collet. That ain't going anywhere. Cool. Now, lower it down. It's a simple matter. Drop this guy in. Get down the side here and have a look. That's looking pretty good. Pull that out, and then this side is the lock. Done. Easy. Move a few things out of the way. Last thing to do is to put the saddle on, my router table saddle on my rip fence, on the saw. A dedicated router table is easier than this because otherwise you find yourself jumping in between one process and another process. Let's push this back a little. I'll line it up with the front. It locks on mine with mag switches here. So it's locked onto the fence. I'm going to bring it up to about there. Move the dust port from here straight over to here. Cool. Nearly time. We're almost there. And I'm going to rotate this ever so slightly so that it's 90 degrees. Bring it back so the bearing disappears. Put the piece of wood in front of it to line up with the bearing. That's it. Lock it. Push it along until... Yep, that's good. And I don't want to have my fingers down there at all. So I'll slide these on. way and then this one on the top. I was going to use the uh, the Jessen stock guides, clear cut stock guides, but the timber was too narrow for it to get a grip properly. So I've gone with these. I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on it. That's good. And then here Actually, I'm going to move it forwards a little bit so it's right over the right over the cutter. Good. And it's there. Excellent. Easy. Now, a little bit more noise. Quick drink. Put this little guy in the switch. And final check. All good, all good, all good. Turn it on. Make a bit of noise. Speed it through. So I don't have to worry about where it's going. Pull it through. It's a little deep. All right, we'll go again, see what happens. On the other side. 
luckily we are going to be cutting a little bit off it. As in the thickness. Come back up here. All right, I'm going to do a little bit of adjusting with it and run some of this stuff through the thicknesser and play around with the depth. But that's, give you an idea, that'll give me a nice little round at the top so it'll guide the plane into the bed. I'll make sure that that's the right width to drop into the dados and that'd be that. All right, we're going to have the Patreon meeting just after the show. So it's going to start in a couple of minutes. I've fixed up the sound issues that we were having. Uh, I'm going to have a quick look down here, just in time to see the finish. I can answer any questions you may have in addition to the pictures, Dave Chan. Of course, go for it, Wally. Um, Wally, well, this is what the chat is all about. Don't forget to do the same on Dave's Facebook page as well. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. But sad note. Uh, my arm broke a last last week. That's no good. Here's the thing. See this part here? You don't have to get these. You can buy these. I, when I got these, uh, George sent me a couple of these up, the lenses up as well. So the lenses just pop in there. I'll show you. Whoop, don't smash it. There we go. They clip in. So I've got some darker ones that I use for outside when I'm you know, working outside in the sunshine. And I pop those on. And away we go. Um, yes, all done. All right, thank you everyone for watching. Look after yourselves, be nice to each other. Patreon chat in a minute. See you later.